I'm actually going to talk about some stuff that I think will make all your lives easier um, over the long run. And, and I think it's a different way that material on the web and is going to get organized. Um, and it's something that makes everything that I saw this morning, I think, work better. It, it, it enables those things. Before I get started, though, I, I, I want to do an experiment. I would like you each um, to choose something to focus your thoughts on. And just, I, I want you to observe yourself how you do it. I want you to actually focus your thought on whatever you chose. And do that right now. And then pay attention to what your eyes are doing. OK, has everybody done that? So, so just out of curiosity, how many of you chose something that you could actually see? And how many of you chose something in your imagination? OK, about evenly split. Interesting. OK, I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, but a, a lot of this is, a lot of what I'll be talking about is how people are, are, are very different in sort of what their normal interests and, and, and preferences are. And I think that that's a fundamental way in which people are different. Um, the problem that I'm going to be working on is one that we've been talking about a lot, which is you know, there, there are lots of different kinds of people out there that have different knowledge, different needs, different interests. And there's a lot of material out on the web um, that are learning, er, learning resources that they could learn. And the problem is, how do you get the right stuff to the right people? That's exactly the problem that many of the, of the presentations this morning addressed. And I think that part of the problem is that the search engine is not exactly the right tool for that, and that we actually need to put some more information around that material to enable other kinds of things that are more sophisticated than search engines. And many of them have the flavor of, the, of what we talked about this morning. Now, I, I have, we all have a teacher that really meant a lot to us. Unfortunately, I couldn't find a picture of Mrs. Wilner. Um, so I found the icon that most looked like her, except Mrs. Wilner had an eyes and a mouth. But um, <laughs> Mrs. Wilner was uh, this incredible librarian in, in my elementary school who made a huge difference to me personally. Um, because she actually would ask me these questions about what I was interested in. She was interested in my passions, but, but she was also kind of interested in what I thought. And so I would ask her for, I was really interested in collecting rocks, and I would ask her for books on rocks. And she said, oh, let me show you this book on electricity. I would like ask her for mystery stories, and she showed me my first science fiction book. And she kind of had a model of what I would need next, not just what I was looking for, but what I should be looking for. And, and actually, the, the material that she found for me had a huge impact on my life. And so what I would love to do is figure out, you know, how did she solve that problem, all the material that was out there and, and connected? She's kind of my model. I think that she basically had three things available to her to do that. One of them is she knew many of the students. And so she had a model of those students. And she, and she got those because she had a way of assessing the students. She had questions she would ask. She had you know, ways of kind of probing them to find out sort of what kind of person they were, what their interests were, and what they actually knew. And then she had a picture of all the resources that were available in her mind. And so she could use those three things together to get the right resources to the right students. So that's, that's kind of my model of what would be perfect if, if teachers could really spend the time to understand all the resources out there and really spend the time with every student. This is what they would do. Um, but, but of course, you can't generally spend that time. Now, the way that things are organized right now, and this, this goes both for traditional textbooks, but also material out on the web is we typically package these things all together. So we, we typically, for instance, a, a textbook or website is targeted for a particular student with a particular knowledge, maybe you know, second grade math students or second grade math students that are this stage or something like that. And it sort of assumes a baseline of knowledge. It assumes that, they're, uh, that they uh, have certain things that are going to be easy for them and hard for them. It, typically is built in with it some testing material that sees if they get it, along with the presentation material. And those all come as a package. Because material is like that, it's sort of hard to, um, it, 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 it's hard to create the online Mrs. Wilner who sort of needs those in, in, in separate parts. 
So what I'm going to talk about today is a new kind of way of architecting things, where there's and it's kind of a geeky thing. It's a data structure in the center, which is a, the learning map, which is a representation of all the material that there is to know. So the common core would be an example of this within a little micro world. But I see the common core as a little tiny, tiny piece of this map. So it's a representation of all the things that could be learned. And material would then be hooked to that representation by tags on the sites. And it would be labeled. So for instance, this material is intended to teach this concept, and it assumes you already know these concepts. If you did that, then you could also hook assessment material, which was produced completely separately, also to those concepts. So really, for uh, assessment ought to be decoupled from uh, the teaching material, so that the, teacher, the assessment really shouldn't test, did you get through this material correctly? It should really test, do you have that, that fundamental concept? And then, on top of that, too, that allows for a student model, which I'll talk about, which also references that learning map of what did the student actually know, what is the student actually interested in, and so on. And that those things together make it possible to build, I think, do a better job of building the kind of tools that you were talking about this morning. So I'm going to, I'm going to talk about that in, in particular, some of the pieces that need to be filled in. But the first piece of it that, that we're working on right now, and this is the piece that Applied Minds is doing for the Gates Foundation, is trying to define that central learning map of how do you represent things like the Common Core and all the, the general versions of it so that we can build up an online representation of all the things that are to be learned to hook all this material to. So I picked the Common Core because it's an example everybody's familiar with, and it's probably the best worked out example of an attempt to really go through and make a learning map of an area. And so this thing that I'm showing you here is a, is, is a browser that we have for that structure. So I, I'm assuming that the Common Core is kind of a, becomes a filter on the learning map. It's a way of looking at the learning map. And you can look through that material and kind of zoom in to a particular area or something like that on it. And so you might choose the Common Core filter, or you might choose the State of Minnesota filter, or you might have a completely different take on it. And, those will, each, each one of those views on it will reference a slightly different set of concepts um, and let you kind of look through it and, and connect to it. But that's, that's one way of looking at a learning map. I think it's a kind of, it, it's a kind of a bureaucratic way of looking at a learning map. And what would be really nice is if we had other representations that you could actually show the students the learning map. I mean, I would have loved that when I went into, uh, fourth grade, if somebody had actually literally given me a map. And maybe it was you know, themed for different people would get different maps depending on what their passions were. Um, but this is a map that would have worked for me in fourth grade. And actually, it was interesting, but we started this project. And I sat down with graphic designers and said, hey, I want, you know, I want to make this map. Several of them actually brought in maps that they had made in fourth grade, that they had drawn. You know, that, and, and they kept them. That it was, but if people had given me kind of a picture, you know, instead of just, you know, it was a mysterious process that was going to happen to me for a year and then stop. Now, if, if somebody had kind of given me a picture, this is the world that we're going to be exploring. I, didn't, I wouldn't have to know what all those things were in that world. I would just have to kind of see that there was a lot of stuff to be learned there. And actually, these are things that one of the things we've gone through with the Common Core is we've gone through and kind of named elements in the Common Core. So these are actual elements, these are actual Common Core elements from the fourth grade Common Core. Then, if you did that, then you could have some sense of progress during the year of what have you covered, what have you done. So I can kind of imagine that as you, uh, as you learn in the year, the sort of the path fills out, the map fills out, you can kind of see what little areas you miss. So, you, so your assessment appears on the map. So I can imagine literally giving this to a fourth grader and letting them see what it is, you know, some, some tangible picture of what it is that they're learning. Now, in order to get that, you know, what have, what have you actually learned, you need some representation, not just of what you've learned, but you need some representation of the student. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the student representation. This is an area where I think we're just kind of inventing what it is. Clearly, two things about the student that are relevant. 
Um, one of them is what interests them. I'm going to be talking a lot about that uh, today, mostly because I don't understand it very well. And so I'm trying to figure it out. And then it's what do they actually know? You know what competencies do they have? What skills, what particular knowledge do they already have? Now, the interest them, so actually, let me talk about the, the what do they know. I think that's maybe the easier part when you have the learning map, because the learning map is a map of what they're intended to be. So if you have something like the Common Core, then it's fairly straightforward to map students against that particular thing. So this is, again, just a tool we have for viewing the, the student model. And I'm, I'm sure you've things, seen things like it. You can kind of zoom into a particular skill or something like that and, and, and see. And it just gives you have a red, green, yellow assessment is, you know, you can kind of see that that group of students is missing that set of skills right there. So this is a tool that a, a teacher could use for the whole classroom and just look at, look at their students against the common core and uh, see both individuals but also get some kind of picture of what, um, where, where the classroom stands in general. So if you, had, if you had a way of assessing it, if you had good assessment tools, and you had a map of what they would be learned, this is a fairly straightforward thing to build. A much subtler thing is, is what are students interested in. And I think one dimension of it uh, got uh, several groups talked about this morning was their passions. And I think that is an important dimension. I think it's really often it's a, it's a very helpful hook for a kid if you know that they're really excited about horses or space or cars or something like that. I think, too, our, our job as educators and, you know, for, particularly with kids, is to sort of expand their passions and, and open those up. And I think a lot of what a, a good teacher knows about a kid is more than just the specifics of what they're passionate about, but it's something about their style of, of thinking and, and, and what they're interested in, in a sort of more abstract sense. So there's a whole school of psychology that's tried to study you know, are there ways of course, categorizing people, what, what their interests are, and so on? One thing I'm pretty sure it's true because everybody comes up with it over and over again, the same, the same thing. And I, I think it's just one example of the kind of thing I'm talking about. For instance, the question that I started out by asking you, some people are actually fundamentally much more interested in objects inside their imagination. And some people are much more interested in things out in the world. They're interested in their senses. If you think about something, there's, there's sort of two ways to see something. You can see it with your eyes, you can see it with your senses, or you can see it in your imagination. And people have their preferences to which of those they actually think is, is fundamentally more interesting. And so that little question I did right at the beginning, I'm curious, did, how, how many people even thought that there was another alternative from what they did? In other words, how many people realized there was some ambiguity when I said pick something to think about whether meant something in the room or something on the inside of your head. OK, so actually, quite a few people did in this group. So they're an unusual group. But most people, in fact, it never even occurs to them that there's, you pick something, pick something, they'll naturally either go inside or outside. And, and there's a spectrum of people. There are people who have very, very strong preferences. I'm, I'm a very strong inside person. And you, sometimes people have to sort of remind me to look on the outside of, like, look at what's right in front of me because I'm so stuck on what's on the inside. And there are people that are very, and there are people that are immediate. So there's kind of a spectrum of people in that. Another dimension that there seems to be a spectrum on, too, is whether people kind of like collaborative things or they like things that they can do themselves. And again, there are people that are extreme, and there are people that are in the middle on this. And of course, everybody likes to do a little bit of both. But people do have their preferences in that. So that way of, of those particular dimensions, I'm not suggesting these are the only ones. But what's interesting about these is these, these keep getting rediscovered over and over again by anybody who looks at this. And in fact, if you go back and look at Plato, he had those dimensions. And then he kind of had his names for the four quadrants. And Aristotle came along. He had a different set of names. He had those dimensions, too. In the Middle Ages, there were the, the four humors. It's again, it's exactly maps onto those dimensions. People talked about somebody being sanguine or choleric that really you know, is, is, is defined by those same four dimensions. More modern things, Myers-Briggs and cursy type classifiers and things like that, it's all, it's all exactly the same thing. They all come up with these kind of four quadrants of people. 
and, and the same, same two dimensions of dividing things up. So if you know that about a kid, and, and, and probably any teacher does intuitively know that about any kid they really get to know, then they find different kinds of material actually interest them. So for example, in the one that Kersey calls artisans, they are really engaged by pictures of things, videos. They're very visual. On the other hand, the ones that um, tend to be in the upper right quadrant are the, they're the kind of the poets, the storytellers. The, you know, they, they tend to be engaged by stories, particularly stories about people, biographies, things like that. In the lower left quadrant, the ones that Aristotle called the guardians, you know, they tend to be very fact-oriented. You can really interest them with facts. It was funny, when I, when I made up these slides, I actually um, ran them by these, uh, these graphic artists. The graphic artists all wanted to take that fact about hummingbirds and make it in beautiful different colors of fonts and put decorations and curly cues around it and things like that. And I, was like, and I was like, why are you doing that? And they're like, well, I mean, we have to make it look interesting. And I was like, no, 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 but it's actually interesting that hummingbirds eat that much nectar. You know, it's <laughs> you know, they, but, you know, for them, it, it was sort of fundamentally uninteresting because it was uninteresting visually. Of course, I'm, I'm, I'm down in the sort of theoretical quadrant. You know, I like theories. Of, I love, you know, abstract theories of the nitrogen cycle or the food chain and things like that. And, and for me, that I find that as engaging as, you know, the visually oriented person finds a picture of something. But now obviously, you know, you can't, uh, there's some things that everybody has to learn. But it's good to know with kids and actually adults, too, What's going to be the kind of thing that's going to hook them into it? You know, these are different things that might, if you're teaching kids a biology class about the food chain, you see, I think of it as being about the food chain, but other people would think about it as being about animals and what they eat, or, you know, there's different ways of looking at it, or, you know, about the people that created this. You would, you would come into it in different ways for different kids. So what we need then is a representation of the student, and this has to be a lot more complicated than the kinds of thing I'm talking about, but it, it's going to have to have two elements in it. It's going to be some representation of the student, so what are their sort of fundamental preferences, and of course, what are their passions? And then a very specific representation, like that red, green, yellow diagram I showed you of, of what they actually do know, what concepts have they gotten, what competencies do they have. That hooks into the learning map. And I'm talking about hook into, I mean online. It has links into it. They reference, it references the learning map. And then we need a set of ways of labeling content that's out there on the web that also references the learning map. What does this actually teach? What does this assume you know? And we need another thing which doesn't exist at all now, which is we need a set of modular assessments, which are not tied to the material. They're sort of independent assessments. Um, which really try to specifically say, do they know this concept, do they not? And, and those are going to be created by lots of different people. And so those will also be labeled and connected on the learning map. So the learning map becomes the, the online thing, the sort of index that, that ties it all together. If that existed, then it would be fairly easy to build, I mean, not easy, but possible at least, to build you know, what would be my favorite app, which would be you know, the Mrs. Wilner app, which it would look my map of knowledge, which I think goes beyond the common core at this point, but the knowledge, the, the learning map, I imagine, really covering everything. And it would look at it and say, OK, I look at it and I see you have a big, I, I'd love to see a map of my ignorance. And, you know, and I'd love somebody like Mrs. Wilner or something like Mrs. Wilner to look and say, here, here's this big thing you don't know about, which you need to know about. This is a big hole in your knowledge. And find me and say, now given what you do know and given the kind of stuff you like, here's this great online material that helps you learn that. And I think that it will be possible to build many such, I think there will be many, many such applications. And I think what will enable it is for us to kind of agree on a set of standards, just like the you know, web was built on a set of standards, as to how to represent the learning map how to label material like you know, the learning resources, metadata initiative, how to label assessment materials, which we haven't even begun to tackle, and how to model a student of what do they know and what do they like. 
So I'm looking forward to that happening, and I suspect uh, a lot of you are going to be the ones that make it happen. Thank you very much.